choir as always. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for what you do and how you lead us in worship. Y'all always do a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Good morning. I hope you have had a Merry Christmas. Hey. I normally don't embarrass people. I won't call her name, but see a friend in the, in the congregation that I haven't seen in a long time. Don't leave before I give you a hug. Um, but it's great to see you. I hope you've had a wonderful Christmas weekend. For some of you, maybe it's still continuing. Um, even today, we're glad you've chosen to come to worship with us this morning. Um, if you were to ask my family, even my five-year-old, I think, would give you the same answer. What daddy's favorite television show is, they would tell you Sports Center. Because every morning, or any time I'm home, really, if there's nothing else on TV, if I'm sitting down to eat and we're not at the table, so if I'm eating breakfast by myself or... If it's lunchtime or whatever, it doesn't matter who's home, it doesn't matter what's going on. When I sit down, I want a few minutes where I don't really have to think about anything, don't want to have to worry about anything, and I turn on Sports Center. And the reason I do it is not because I think Sports Center's all that great and that you know there's no bad news in sports, because sometimes there are things that frustrate me and you know make me wish I hadn't watched it, but not nearly as much as the regular news. The regular news is somewhat depressing and frustrating sometimes, and it's just more than I can handle. It you know, just makes me think about things I just don't care to think about. So I watch Sports Center. I love sports. I was never really good at playing sports. Tennis is about the only thing I ever played and was decent at, but I love sports. I love to watch sports, and for me, it's just kind of something I can watch and let go. Unless it's the Gamecocks or the Tigers playing, I really don't even get all that riled up about it. I can enjoy it. And it's just, it's just something that I like. But I like SportsCenter because they'll show a lot of the interviews, a lot of the stuff that you don't necessarily see in the regular broadcast. They'll show the players, you know, interview after a match or after a game. They'll show the coaches, interviews, and so forth. And, and I really enjoy, you know, seeing the, the, the goods and the bads about the character of these people that we pay a lot of money to watch. Um, it just boggles my mind how much money these people make. But they are entertaining. If you, how many of you like sports? Am I, am I talking? To, okay, all right, a lot of sports. How many of you especially love college football? Very good. Okay, we're all on the same page. It's my favorite time of the year is college. As much as I love golf, I love college football more. And, and I enjoy watching how different teams, how different players, how different coaches respond when they win and when they lose. I don't know if you've ever played on a sports team or maybe you've even been on an academic team, some sort of competitive team. Have you ever been in a situation where you were walking into the match, you were walking into the game, and you knew there was absolutely no way that you were going to lose, that you were going to win? You knew you were going to win. It didn't matter what the other team did. There was no possible way that they were going to beat you. Anybody ever been in a situation like that where you were just you know, the other team was such an underdog, it was, it was hopeless for them. Okay, a few. I guess, and, and this analogy, by the way, breaks down from, from here on out. Um, because we know that in, you know, in real life and in sports, there's never a guarantee. As much as you might be favored to win a game, there's always the, uh, there's always the chance that that favored team is going to be overly confident and they're going to, you know, not play their best and that the underdog team is going to just play out of their mind and win the game. There's always that chance. We know that in real life. But sometimes there are those situations where you feel like, my goodness, there's really no way that's going to happen. Like, you know, when one of our Division I teams plays a Division II team, which we lost this year, but, you know, normally you think we're going to win. You know, it's just a guarantee that we're going to win. How do you handle yourself? How do you conduct yourself? How do you behave? When the win is guaranteed, or when you feel like the win is guaranteed. Basically, what I watch, when I watch Sports Center, I, I, say, I see three different types of people. There's the, there's the, the first type of, of winner that, that goes into the game taunting the underdog team, just giving them a hard time, talking trash, tell, they're, not, they're not worthy of being on the same field as us, and so forth, and they just, they just really put down the opposing team. And that's, that's the way they conduct themselves when they're facing an, an absolute, what they feel like is an absolute win. 
Then you've got the people that are a little more subtle about it. They, they're not necessarily rude or disrespectful or say anything mean or, or whatever, but they're kind of like my tennis coach that I took lessons from when I was a kid. We would always have times when a group of us would get together and take lessons, we would have a time where we could challenge the coach. And it was always fun. You always wanted to see if you could at least win a point or two, win a, win a game or two off of him. But what my coach would do is he wouldn't talk trash to us. He wouldn't put us down. He wasn't ugly to us. But he would play left-handed, which is basically doing the same thing, just less rudely, I guess. But basically saying, you stand no chance. I can beat you left-handed. And my, by the way, my coach was right-handed. So, you know, for those of you saying, well, I could beat you left-handed too because, I'm, you know, my coach was right-handed and he would beat us left-handed. And so there's that type of person. They're a little more subtle, but they're still pretty arrogant about their skills. And then you have those few, those few teams, those few athletes, those few coaches that at the end of the game, even before the game, they speak well of the, of the opposing team. They, they talk about how they're, they're practicing hard. They get to the game and they actually play well. They play their best. They play like they're supposed to play. They're a good team. They ought to play well. And then... You know, the score gets up to a certain place, then they put in their second string, their third string, give those guys an opportunity to, to play. And then at the end of the game, the coaches and some of the players are interviewed, you know, how would you feel going into this game when you knew you were going to win this game? And they say positive things about the opposing team. You know what, we're just fortunate to be able to be on the same team, on the same field as, as, as this other team today, and they played hard, and we've been watching their program, their program's really been improving, and you know, it's just, just an honor to play them, we're, we're glad that we walked away with a win, we played hard, our guys did a great job, they love each other, they work together, and I'm just really proud of our team as well, but you know, it's just a, a real quality win for us, even when everybody knew they were going to win. Now those kinds of people, those kinds of athletes, those kinds of coaches, what happens when you watch them, when you listen to them? How do you respond? Isn't it hard not to be a fan of those kinds of people? When you hear them, you know, respond humbly and, and speak respectfully of their opponent, isn't it hard not to, not to say, you know what, even if I was pulling for the other team, I've got to say, I, I really like that Dabo Sweeney, you know? Every time I watch him, I'm amazed at how humble he is. And here they are, they're undefeated this year. But at, at every turn, he conducts himself, in my, in my mind, in a godly way. And I'm a Gamecock fan. But I have to tell you, it's hard not to be a Tiger fan a little bit too. Because of the way they conduct themselves. Even when they walked into games that they knew they were going to win. They've conducted themselves well. And that's something that sticks out to me. Now let's think about this from the perspective of a Christian. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ here this morning, you are serving the victor of victors. The war that, that our God is fighting has already been won. As followers of Jesus Christ, we walk every day of our lives in victory. Not just hoping we're going to win, not just pretty sure we're going to win, but knowing that the war is already won. We are victorious. The win has been guaranteed. And what absolutely sometimes boggles my mind and breaks my heart is to see many people who call themselves believers, and even churches, not, not our church, specifically, but, but I even see churches who live as though they are defeated, who live as though they are hopeless, who every time they, they run into a little pit stop along the way in life and something doesn't go their way, or something goes wrong, or, or some pain, or some struggle, or some hurt comes their way, everything falls apart, and there's nothing victorious about them. They walk around with their heads hanging low. And this morning, I, I really, I titled the message a little bit wrong. You need to cross out what the, 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 the first word in your bulletin there. Instead of living victoriously, just live victoriously. I want us to talk about this morning, what does it look like to really live victoriously? As Christians, that is how we should live our lives. But what does that look like? How do we do that? I want us to go to 1 John chapter 5. 
1 John chapter 5. Now this is the challenge as we stand between Christmas day before yesterday, the coming of the Lord, and I hope that you have celebrated Christmas with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I hope that you've not only celebrated Jesus coming into the world, I hope what you've been able to celebrate is that Jesus has come into your life, that he has forgiven you, that he has made you a new creation. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. But we stand between, today we stand between Christmas and on Friday, the coming new year in 2016. And my challenge to us this year is that we as a church and that we as individual believers would daily live victoriously. How do you do that? What does that look like? Let's look here in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Some beautiful verses. John's a great writer, just a passionate, passionate man. Uh, loved Jesus with all his heart. Walked with Jesus. Knew him intimately. And he writes these words in the last chapter of his first letter. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I don't know about you, but sometimes the enemy can kind of creep into our minds a little bit and cause us to start thinking that the world can somehow overcome us. And there are people, there are people in our churches, there are people that call themselves followers of Jesus Christ who give in to that lie on a regular basis, thinking that I have been overcome by the world. There's no hope. There's no chance for me. It's over. And I'm here to tell you this morning, as John has told us, that if you are born of God, you have already overcome the world. There is victory in Jesus Christ. And it's not something we have to just hope is going to happen or we think is going to happen or there's a really good chance it will. It's already done. The victory has been won and God is giving us an opportunity to jump on the wagon. And if you haven't gotten on, I hope that today will be the day that you do. What does it look like to live victoriously? First of all, John talks about in the, in the first verse and in the fifth verse, he kind of bookends this little section with the same key truth. That the most important thing is that you and I believe in Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the God-man, God in the flesh. That's Christmas. That's the incarnation of Christ. We must believe not just that Jesus is the Son of God and that, yeah, he was around and he did some things. And he was a good teacher. and things, But Jesus came in the flesh, walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like to be a human being. He knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to laugh. He knows what it's like to be stabbed in the back. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to have everybody turn their back on him. He knows what it's like to be crushed by the wrath of God. God, which, by the way, none of us know. He knows what it's like to be tempted in every way. He has identified with us. He has walked in your shoes. No matter what you're going through, whether Jesus actually dealt with your very specific circumstances, he knows what it's like, even better than you do, he knows what it's like to walk in your shoes. And he gave his real life that he lived on this earth for 30 some years. He walked physically on this earth and he gave his life. It wasn't taken from him. It, he gave his life on the cross. And he rose again three days later, literally, physically rose from the grave. 
And then just a short time later, he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes on our behalf day in and day out. He never sleeps, he never slumbers, he is with you at all times. And John says, before you understand anything, if you're going to live victoriously, you need to understand and you need to believe, you need to be changed. That word believe is not just to give intellectual agreement to, it means to be changed by the truth that God came in the flesh, that he is the Christ. Christ. And if you really believe that, you won't just go to church a little more often. It will change your life. And he says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus came in the flesh, has been born of God. That's John chapter 3 that we talked about last week. To be born again, to be born from above, to be completely changed. Have you been completely changed by Jesus? Or have you just become a little more religious throughout your life? There's a difference. There's an eternal difference between those two. So the first key is that we must believe in this very real Jesus who has given his life for us, And when we believe that, when we are changed by that, when we place our faith in him, then he changes us. We are then born of God. And then everyone who loves the Father, if we're born of God, what are we going to do? We're going to love who? We're going to love our Father. Now I know that in this, in this room, there are probably people in this room who grew up either with an absentee father or a father who hurt you in some way, that abused you in some way, neglected you in some way. Lots and lots of people deal with earthly father issues. And sometimes those issues get kind of pressed onto God. Say, well, my earthly father was kind of a bum, so I have a hard time trusting God as my father. But let me, let me just help you understand really simply, God as our father is flawless. No matter, no matter how great an earthly father or how sorry an earthly father you may have or may have had, your heavenly father is without fault. He is without failure. He loves you perfectly. And you have every reason and I have every reason to love him. If I am born of him, then I am going to love him. I'm going to put him first. I'm going to want to be like him. I'm going to want to look to him. When I have a problem, he's going to be the first one I want to go to. So everyone born of God loves the Father, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. So here we go. Here's how we apply this as a, as a church, as a congregation. If we're going to live victoriously as a congregation, we must love each other. And I believe that's something we have to do is also to live victoriously as an individual. We must love our brothers and sisters in Christ. John says earlier in his, in his letter, he talks about how you can't say that you love God whom you've never seen and at the same time hate your brother who you can see. Those two things just can't happen. If you say you love God, then you must love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now that doesn't mean we always agree. That doesn't mean that we always, that we always have to you know, be every, each other's favorite person in the world, but it always means that our desire is to be unified, that our desire is to support that our desire is to encourage, that our desire is to, is to desire the truth in each other's lives and to share the truth from our own life. That means warts and all, folks. That's what we've been talking about in 2 Timothy in our Take Up the Torch series and mentoring. It's not just that we should come together once a week at church and put on our nice clothes and put on our fake personality that we don't really have throughout the week. We should be honest and transparent and real with each other. That is what it looks like to genuinely love each other. And church, if we're going to live victoriously, we have to love each other well. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you share your life honestly and transparently with your church family? So then he goes on to describe what this love looks like. And, verse two and verses 2 and 3 are a little confusing because they're, they're said backwards from the way that John says it in the, earlier in the letter. But he says, by this we know that we love the children of God. This is how we know we love each other. 
when we love God and obey his commandments. Now, I would read that and go, well, no, that's how I know I love God. If I love him and keep his commandments, that demonstrates my love for God, right? Well, yes, but it also demonstrates whether or not you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because if you love and obey God and you keep his commandments, his commandments teach us how to love each other. Even the Ten Commandments, just the Ten Commandments alone, talk about our relationship with God, and then they talk about our relationship with each other, how to love each other and how to treat each other, the do's and the don'ts of relationships with fellow human beings. You know, in football, it's easy to, you know, as a coach, somebody like Dabo, it's easy for him to say, you know, hey, we, we played you know, division two team, whatever, I forget who they played this year, but, you know, we played this team, and it's easy to speak well of your opponent, and you say, well, Robbie, spiritually, we shouldn't speak well of our our enemy, but we do need to understand who our enemy is, and who our enemies are not. Sometimes it's tempting to believe, and our real enemy wants us to believe that our enemy is is other human beings. The real enemy, Satan and his demons, the spiritual realm, that's our real enemy, the enemy that you can't see with your physical eyes, the enemy that you can't hear with your physical ears. That's our real enemy. He's our real enemy. They are our real enemy. But he wants us to believe that each other is our enemy, that other, that other human beings our enemies, that are even our fellow church members are our enemies. Let me remind you, we are not each other's enemies. Now, there are some people who are still today, maybe even in this congregation this morning, that are still on the side of the enemy, just like you and I who call ourselves believers today once were. When you are born, you are born an enemy of God, a slave to your sin. So when you and I are born, we are on the side of the enemy, but we are not necessarily hopelessly stuck there. And we need to remember as believers that we are always fighting for, that we are always striving to reach out to and to win those who are still in opposition to Jesus. We we have the opportunity to win them to the Lord. Just like when you hear a coach or a player praise the opponent, you and I need to find way. And that draws, when they do that, that draws people into that, draws supporters, that draws followers, that draws fans. Now, we're not, I'm not really inter- interested in drawing fans to Jesus, but I'm very interested in drawing followers to Jesus. And we're going to see how that plays out in just a minute. But we need to understand who our enemy is and who our enemies are not. And when we obey his commandments, we will love other people more and more and more. As we love God more, we will love others more. And we will love others better. He says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. There are a lot of folks, and I'm just convinced that you just have never really tried this. If you've ever said this, I think you've probably never actually done it. But people will say, you know, it's just just too hard to keep God's commandments. They're They're just too difficult. Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He fussed at the Pharisees at how they they made the law heavy. They made the law difficult as a millstone around people's necks that they couldn't possibly bear. That's not what the Father intended. That is not what his law really does. If you were to live by God's law and you were to actually do that, you would find that the Lord sets you free. Through his commandments. He sets you free through his principles. If you were to live by his commandments, you would find out that when Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free, you'll find out that's actually true. I think a lot of people don't believe it because they've never actually you know, tried to live that way. God's commandments are not burdensome, they set us free. And then we come to the, the verse that I want us to focus on the most this morning. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God, if you have been changed, if you have been made a new creation in God, then you have overcome the world. 
everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Now that doesn't mean that you don't take shots throughout your life. That doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't get a few swings in throughout your life because he does. He got swings in on Jesus, and if he got swings in on Jesus, you can guarantee he's going to get swings in on you. And he gets swings in on me every now and then. And those are difficult times to to face. Our enemy is very real. He's very powerful. He's not to be taken lightly. But he has nothing on our God. Ultimately, We walk into every battle against the enemy, which, by the way, you are in a battle with the enemy every day of your life. What's scary is how many of us walk around oblivious to it. But we are in a battle every day of our life with the enemy. He may get a swing in here and there, but you and I as believers, we walk into every battle the guaranteed victor. Not because there's anything great about us. Not because you're so powerful, you're so smart, or you're so holy. But because our God is. Do you live like you've already won the battle? Or do you walk into these battles and when those arrows come your way, when those punches come your way, do you hang your head? Do you act as though you are defeated? Do you throw your hands up and say, I give up. Many people do. But then look at what John says. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. Now, this is not to say that you are great, that your faith is so amazing because you are so wonderful. That your faith is what is over. We need to understand that people who genuinely live by faith always give praise, honor, and glory to God. They always reject the personal praise, which inevitably seems to come their way. It always seems that when we see somebody act in faith, we say, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so, I'm, I'm, you know, I just, I'm amazed by you or whatever. We give praise to the person. A person who genuinely lives by faith will very quickly say, I give all the glory to God. As a matter of fact, speaking, let's just keep up with Dabo. They cut him off of TV early in the season because he gave glory and honor to his God. Even in a football game, I'm not real convinced that God really cares about football. You know, I I, I don't know. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Some of you may feel very strongly that he does, but I don't know. But I think God deserves the glory of even a football game. See, our faith, our faith overcomes the world in that other people, those people who are still lost, who are still dead in their sins, who are still far from God, the one thing that they can physically see is your faith. It's real, it's tangible, it's right there in front of their face and it overcomes the world. It's that, it's like seeing that interview and hearing that coach or hearing those players praise that weaker team and bless that weaker team and in some way that inspires you to say, you know what, I'm kind of a fan of that team. I'm kind of a fan of that school. I'm kind of a fan of that athlete. I'm, I, you know, I, I'd like to keep up with that coach in some way. Just, just as that little thing kind of draws us in in sports, Even more so in life, when you and I live by faith, lost, you know, broken, hurting people can see your faith and they are drawn by the Holy Spirit to Jesus himself. Living victoriously means living by faith. Means when the enemy hits you, that you get back up. That when the enemy attacks you, you hold your head high, not in arrogance, but in confidence in your God. And that you play the game by his rules. That you live life by his commandments, by his principles. Even when the whole world tells you to do it opposite of him. And you live by faith in such a way that other people see that faith. And they are inspired by that faith. And every single believer in this room today and watching on television wherever you are today. If you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, your faith matters to somebody. There is somebody who is desperate to see your very real living and active faith. And my question to you is, is there something for them to see? 
Let's think about it as a church, as a congregation. When people look at First Baptist Church, do they see a church that lives by faith in God? I hope and pray that they do. The only way that happens is if we love God, we love each other, we fight with our heads high, and we live by faith. We trust Him. We don't, we don't trust the bottom line. We don't trust the reputation in the community. We trust our God, and we live by His Word. We preach His Word. We submit to His Word. We live by His Word, and we live by faith in the risen Son of God. I have two quick challenges for us this year. First of all, is that every day of our individual lives in 2016, that you and I will strive to live victoriously. And as a church, that we would do the same. And that we would genuinely live by faith in such a way that others would see it. And there's one practical measuring stick that I want to put before us. In 2016, I wish I, I wish I was brave enough to give a number, but I'm not going to give a number. But this year, how many times can we fill up that baptismal pool? How many times can we fill it up? Because if you and I are living by faith, I believe that pool will get filled over and over and over and over again as people are one to Jesus Christ. Now, Rex, he's a pretty amazing guy. He can lead a lot of people to Jesus. Me, I'm much less amazing, but I, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to lead some people to Jesus. But it's not our job alone. It's not our privilege alone. It's not our calling alone. It's yours. Are we going to live by faith? Are we going to live victoriously this year? Because if we do, we are going to see person after person after person come from death into life. Let's be part of God's life-changing plan this year and live victoriously. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that in you, we have no reason to ever feel like or believe or act or live as though we are defeated. We have not won the battle. We have not won the war. You have. And you have invited us. You have called us. You have adopted us as your sons and daughters. And that invitation is still open today for anyone who does not know Jesus as their Lord, Savior, Master, King, and Friend. Today, we can still be born of you. And Lord, may we live as though we are children of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May we live that way individually. May we live that way as a congregation. And Lord, may you work through our faith, through the faith that you impart to us that we don't get credit for. May you work through that faith that other people can see. And may you bring many, many more into your family. May you bring many, many more into your kingdom. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be honest, to be true, to love each other well, to follow your commandments well. And to keep our faith on display 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what is thrown our way. Give us strength. Give us confidence in you. Give us passion and boldness that we would not give in to fear, that we would live victoriously. In Jesus' name, amen. always some way that you and I are supposed to respond to God. Now, I don't know what way you need to respond to him this morning, but this is a time to do that. If there is any public response that you need to make, now is the time to do that. I'm going to be down front. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. And I hope today that you would give your life to Jesus. I'd love to pray with you, encourage you, get to know you. So come down and, and share that decision with me if that's a decision you need to make.
If you need a church home, somewhere to serve the Lord, a family to be a part of, a place where you can grow spiritually, we would love to have you here. And that's something else I would love for you to come down and let me know. If you'd love to join this church, we would love to have you. And there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of gifts and talents that I believe the Lord wants to send our way. And I hope that you are one of those, one of those people. Um, so if you need to join the church today, please come forward. If you need to pray, this altar is open. There are a few poinsettias, but there's still plenty of room there if you'd like to take time to pray. And as I always say, if there's someone in this room that you need to pray with or pray for, don't be afraid to cross the aisle. Don't be afraid to put your hymnal down and to do business with the Lord today. This is our time of response. So let's stand together and sing this hymn together.